So as Christina already showed you on the uh, wireframes, um, we were developing a whole inventory. So different uh, offices will be able to restrict different things for different purposes. And so a hold is associated to a student for a given time period. And that may be a date range or it may be a term range, say from fall through spring. Um, sometimes the dates are not um, the most appropriate way to handle things because you may be doing drop and add activity during the fall semester while you are doing original registration for the spring semester. So sometimes that you'll need that term specificity rather than a date range. Almost always, ultimately, holds originate from some other system, such as a housing health services parking system. Um, a bursar system is a, is a good example. But certainly, as, as things move into the quality student umbrella, like the student accounts receivable um, modules, those types of things need not be done by holds, even though our current systems may be performing the actions that way. Um, each hold itself, as Christina showed you on the wireframe, may prevent a variety of activities, um, anything from registration-oriented things, obtaining transcripts, um, getting a housing contract, things outside of the Kuali sphere. So we gave a couple of examples here. Um, a bursar or a hold that may prevent registration and the production of an official transcript and the issuance of a diploma, but not uh, restrict the production of an unofficial transcript, which may be used for internal purposes. Likewise, um, an academic integrity hold may prevent the student from dropping classes, but not the production of any form of transcript. An exa a good example of that would be if there was a, a plagiarism case and the student received a failing grade on the particular item that was plagiarized, and it was determined by the student conduct office that the student isn't able to drop that class. They, may, they have to take um, the effects of their cheating, and it's going to appear on their transcript. So there are a variety of combinations that can go on. Um, it's going to be our intent is to make it very granular, um, and that um, Different types of holds or different holds can all restrict the same activity. An individual student may ultimately have three holds that all restrict um, original registration for a term. And this is done so that as the student clears each hold and satisfies whatever requirement is necessary, there isn't a complicated uh, determination necessary of, oh, can they register now? So each hold um, can overlap with others as far as what it is that they block. Before we move on from this slide. Okay. So a central administrator would be responsible for maintaining the inventory. Um, who can administer them, as Christina showed you? Uh, on the wireframes and what activities and functions are impacted by the hold, specific information about the hold, what office to contact about it, et cetera. And as we talked previously in the permissions um, area, the administration of the placement and removal of holds would be role and qualifier based. It's entirely possible that the people who put on the hold are not the people who remove it. And so we're going to, our intent is to have that fine granularity of control on this. Any questions? All right, moving along. Now we get to what we're calling exemptions. And Steve, an Steve, exemption. Before you, on, okay. before you move on, I'm sorry to interrupt. Before you move on to exemptions, um, could you maybe back up a little bit and highlight, um, back up to slide, where is it? Slide number 35, um, understanding blocks, and maybe highlight some of the differences between blocks and holds. So we talked about blocks, and then we looked at holds, so might help there. Thanks. So it's a very important distinction to master, and we, we often get um, caught up um, mm -hmm. in, in um, forgetting uh, what we've decided about them. But a, but a block is a, an evaluation of information or criteria on a student's record. 
um, evaluating rules and looking at the student's record to see if they meet those rules. It is, it's a verb. We, can, we consider them to be verbs. So the, the system will block activity. A hold, actually, we consider to be a noun. That is something that is actually placed on a student's record and removed from a student record. Blocks, the only way they can um, no longer be effective in the student circumstances, either some information on that student record has changed or the student has received an exemption. So exemptions basically relate to blocks. Holds are their own thing. Let me pause there, because there uh, hopefully are questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds probably not the time for me to ask them, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. I mean, if it'll, uh, yeah, it'll, I'm it'll illuminate. I, 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 I'm kidding. I think I'm finally. Uh... But some of it is like a terminology issue, and sometimes, you know, these are kind of vague concepts, or we use these t terms um, interchangeably or a little bit loosely. And so some of, like, these definitions are great. It's just our, it's like saying, okay, here's how we're going to define block. Here's when we say block now collectively, here's what we mean. And sometimes the challenge for institutions, particularly new institutions coming in, is layering their terminology against, you know, and on top of ours. You may have, you may actually mean something different locally when you say block, but at least for the purposes of quality student, you know, this is the way we're thinking about a block and what a block is and how it differs from a hold. So just want to reassure you that if it seems a little confusing, it's, there's no magic bullet for some of these things. We just have to pick a definition and stick to it sometimes. So thanks. And that, that was helpful. And and, that, and that's why we do the noun versus verb. A block isn't a thing. It's an, it's an action, whereas a hold is actually a thing. So we don't speak of putting blocks on students. We right. speak of blocking things. And that was several weeks of meetings and, and agreement, and Carol's been assimilated. <laughs> <laughs> I've drank the Kool-Aid, <laughs> Okay, so if we get back to slide 40 and managing the exemption inventory. So uh, an, e an exemption is a persisting time-based grant of an exception. Now, the exception, we use that term very guardedly because it has special meaning in the Java world. But it's an exception or a waiver to a given policy, which usually invalidates some form of a block. Okay? The um, the exemption request may be initiated by students, instructors, or advisors. And initially, what, what we're going to um, put in the product is merely the ability to register an exemption for someone. Um, so in, in the first phases, we'll be looking at um, registrars or perhaps departmental uh, advisors recording an exemption for a student. Later, we're going, we hope to build in the entire um, approval request and approval of workflow process in that. So uh, some examples of what would be typical exemptions. So any requisite waiver, so um, waiving a prerequisite, a co-requisite, or an anti-requisite. Program-based restrictions. So anything that requires a particular credential to do something uh, could be enrollment in a course enrollment that you can't take a course if you're at the master's level. So that type of thing could receive an exemption. Schools, majors, minors, all of that sort of thing. And this is by no means exhaustive. Any kind of year or class level restriction, juniors, year three students only. And also the whole gamut of degree audit requirements, whether you can do substitutions or waivers of certain requirements. And those things are all planned to be handled on the quality student side and ultimately passed over to the degree auditing system. Any questions there? All right. Moving on, for each type of exemption uh, requires the definition of who can initiate the exemption the time period of the exemption, the required data for the complete exemption request, so that will be one of the forward-looking features when we build in the workflow, the potential outcomes, and a qualified workflow. So what we mean by that is that it may have specific routing based on the particular organizations. 
A particular school, like engineering, may have a more involved process for handling certain types of exemptions. Other schools, maybe smaller schools, it may require a very simplified approval process. Questions there? And then we move on to Kathy. I, we've mastered holds, exemptions, and blocks. Wow, I'm very that. impressed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I say we, uh, we get started again. Um, so just, just a little orientation about what's going to happen from this point forward. Kathy's going to um, talk to us about services as they relate to setting up the registration environment, holds, and exemptions. Um, and then Christina, we're going to take a step back and she's going to go through the application map again. I think it's a really good tool for helping understand where all this functionality falls and so we're going to circle back on that. And then I'll do an orientation to location and structure of the business artifacts and other supporting materials uh, for those of you doing your, your self-studies. And then we'll wrap up. So we're moving on. Uh, we're moving at a, at a fairly good clip. Clearly we're not going to take the full four hours today. Um, Again, just as a reminder, that the plan is always to start on time and end early if that's what happens. So we start at 9 a.m. Or, or noon East Coast, um, and if we finish early, we finish early. So, all right, with that introduction, Kathy, I'm going to hand it to you. Thanks, Carol, and uh, I'll, I'll warn you, I have a cup of coffee in my hand from the break, so this may get warm. Um, okay, so... Um, as services was looking at this set of requirements around registration, enrollment, setup, um, we obviously saw holds and exemptions. Those are, are pretty tangible things, as, as Steve helped point out, and, uh, and, and that worked out pretty well. So you'll see them in the, in the blue. The, this is actually also an opportunity to um, that of how the service design process goes. The hold service and the exemption service are actually services that we've released. We've built out the contract in, in Java code, and it's available, and, and um, different operations have been implemented by developers. But we know we had to get it out pretty quickly. So we tag those as sort of work in progress services. So those are certainly further along the continuum in that they're realized and, and codified, but we know that we're going to have to return to them and, and do some more things. Again, back to the problem of how, so that was a, a, a really good way. We got really comfortable with saying we know how to define holds and exemptions, and we know how to apply them to people. So we'll, we'll go into more detail on that. But then the issue became, how do you actually evaluate and hook that into an actual business process, like um, is this student eligible as, as part of registration or when the student goes to their um, basket and tries to start filling it for courses for a particular semester, how do we actually invoke the logic that's going to go look at those holds and then see if there's an exception? So that's what led us to this idea of a process service. Um, the other theme that kept popping up for us was this idea of populations or, or sort of dynamic people sets. Um, I don't know if those of you who remember um, the old dynamic clue set or course set from, from curriculum management. Um, but similarly, we think there's going to be a need to do that around people, certainly around students. So that was the other service that sort of popped up. So what I'm going to go through now is, is share with you really the status of where we are from a service perspective on solving these problems. So again, the hold service is really, in addition to that manage the inventory of what's a hold, it's going to answer the question, is this person on a hold? Do they have a particular the idea of the whole, as Steve said, is these are typically going to come from, or in many cases, they will come from an external system. The issue of what does that impact from an enrollment standpoint is really a separate process to manage. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, defer a little bit because this, this led into some of the um, flexibility we needed in how to solve this problem. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll dig into a picture here in just a second. Um, the exemption service similarly is going to define exceptions to rules and restrictions. Um, exemptions are always granted to people, um, and the exemption always starts with a request. 
So for instance, a student couldn't do something like register for a course, they can either resolve that issue or try to get some kind of exemption for it. Um, exemptions are valid based on effective dates. They may also, though, another thing we heard is this may be a one-time only thing. So its effectiveness may have some general date range, but it may be that once you use it, that's it. You get to use it once. So we've accommodated that in the services. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to now talk a little bit about the hold service. Again, we're going to focus on the teal boxes, because those are the ones that are really managed within this service. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with the issue, because really is, the issue is there's an overdue book, or it might be more specific than that, like it's 60 days overview, and that makes that maybe a different issue type, because the impact of that may be more significant. As Steve pointed out, the issue is typically owned by some kind of organization. Um, and we may also type those issues um, for use later, but it lets you sort of get broad categories of what those issues might be. The hold is actually the thing that gets, it's when this person has this issue, we're now going to attach a hold to that person. And again, there may be types of holds. So now we've got the definition of what the issue is and um, the fact that this particular person has this hold attached to them. <clears throat> the red boxes, remember, are external to this service and managed somewhere else. We have, um, I'll, I'll dip into it now and then we'll go into more detail in a minute. Um, so the idea of the process service is that it's going to actually capture the details of a process that may potentially have um, checks within it where we need to see, for instance, does this person have a hold. So the, the, the process service is where we're really going to not only link in the fact that I need to go check for holds, but also what the impact may be of that hold. And this is where we got into the idea of populations, because it turns out that some checks are also only applied to a particular population of students. I, I'm going to um, pause there and, uh, for this slide and continue to move on, and hopefully we can get through the four services, and then maybe that'll um, clear the mud a little bit right now. You'll also notice on these last two that we, I've included that WIP in our actual service code repository. Um, these services are tagged that way, and that's really just a flag to the devs that um, this, this is uh, a little slippery, and it's probably going to get refined later. So um, exemptions, again, focusing on the teal boxes, there's an exemption request. This is where we may find a need. One of the questions, I think, very early on was how far out are our, our you know, workflow and, uh, and notification? Um, the exemption request may initially be um, pretty, pretty straightforward, as in you know, we, we make one, someone looks at them, and then processes them grants the exception or not. Um, but at some point, there may actually be some kind of workflow that we can put behind that to automatically route things. This is where the idea of some of that typing may help us in, in terms of automating some of that notice, that alert that there is an exemption request and, and then uh, to, to get it to the right person. So the exemption request happens, and uh, it's for a person, and it's also going to get approved by some kind of person. Obviously, different people, but from a modeling perspective, they're they're both people involved in that process. And then the exemption gets requested. If you remember before, um, we talked a little bit about an overall process. And one of the checks in that process may be, does this student have any, um, any library holds? The exemption, the way we've modeled it, is that exemption may be for that particular item, the, the overdue library book, or it may be the overall process of, am I eligible to register? So you can see that, that that actual exemption can go to the check. Oh, it's not showing in here. It's in my other picture. Sorry. Or it can go to the process. So, oh, yeah, it does show. OK, so the request yeah, is what there. will tie it either to the process or the check. So part of that recognition is just that in some cases, there may be a thing where you don't want to have to go create exemption for check, 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 check. You just want to say, get the student in. So we've allowed for that in the service. 
and, and maybe that helps clarify just a, a touch. So, you know, the process is, is your higher level, it's like the business process you're trying to accommodate. And within that process are maybe multiple checks. And that's why it's nice to be able to just tie the exemption directly to the process so you're not overloading your system doing a bunch of checks when you're going to override the whole process anyway. And that's probably a pretty um, um, restricted function to be able to do that. Yeah, right. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is talk about the um, population service, which isn't even really a service yet. It's what we call a sandbox. As we're doing um, the, de the design of services portion, we do a lot of work on the wiki and what we call sandboxes. And the sandboxes are, um, in fact, I think Carol's going to maybe point you to some um, at the I end am. of this for further reference. So just, you know, remember the sandbox is even um, slipperier and, and, you know, you might get a little dirty than a, an actual service repository. So just, just keep that in mind. So populations, we, we have seen populations pop up in a number of areas. Um, the, the one we're talking about right now is over on the right, that, that instruction or that check, that check for that person. It's, it's like, well, we need to check for this if you're this group of students, but not if you're that group of students. So that was one place it showed up. It's also shown up in registration appointments. As, as uh, I don't remember if it was, it was at the Steve or Ruth, but one of them was talking about the fact that registration appointments may be specific to a student, but they may relate to a population or class. You may get an actual registration appointment by that entire group. Um, another area that we haven't really talked about, I think it's coming up in the next discussion, is um, seat pools. And seat pools also rely very heavily on this concept of a population. So we have a thing. The service is very simple. All it does is manage the definition of populations. That population could be just a chem person. It could be a group or role. It could be search criteria, which is similar to some of the stuff that we've done um, over in course sets. Uh, or it might be some, you know, and see, we didn't even spell mushy right, but statement, term, resolve, or mushy. Um, we know we're bumping up um, constantly with rules. From curriculum management, we have our own statement service within Quali Student that is what allowed us to define all of the prerequisite rules. What Rice's KRMS application is, is the ability not only to define rules, but to execute them. So execution of rules, while it wasn't critical in curriculum management, it's, you know, incredibly important in enrollment. I mean, that's why we bothered defining them, is so we can execute them in enrollment. Um, little sidebar, from a development standpoint, one of the other tasks of this period of, of sort of ENR setup and course life development was actually to prove out that we could take our statements as defined in the statement service and actually execute them in KRMS. That is a very preliminary proof of concept, but we've done that success check. Now the issue is, what else might we want to um, untangle from some of the um, logic sequencing and execution that we're finding we need in a complicated enrollment service, and how, do, how are we going to interact and continue to either build on, build with, or build on top of the KRMS RICE tool? So that's why I, you know, that one's important for us to continue to track and, and feed into. Um, so, so populations are really to answer the question, does this apply to me? Is this student part of this population? It's not yet, we may find we need this later, but it's not yet designed to really say, show me all the people in this population. It's more a, is this, if you get the idea. So it's get people in population would be return this whole list. What we're really trying to answer is, is this person in this population? That puppy in the office. <laughs> puppy says yes. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the process service. So the big driver, or one of the big drivers when we started conceiving of the process service was the need to really elevate into an actual UI that, a, that an administrator could manipulate this series of checks that need to happen for various overall processes within the student's um, registration cycle. We'll just stay focused on that right now because that's, that's what we've been working on is this you know, registration setup. Um, 
And so what we realized was we needed a way to do that. We also figured out, you know, um, but I think Steve and Ruth referred to the idea of soft holds or hard holds. Like, what's the impact of this hold? That also is something that really is going to be dependent upon what population am I, ask, am I doing this check for and what process am I in. The idea is that we may want to have these checks that we can use in a number of different business processes. You might want to find out if the student has I'm going to stick with my overdue library book just because it's a little less controversial. That may have one impact in registration, but a different impact if I'm just trying to go you know, view my grades. And then, and then it may also be different if I'm trying to request a transcript. So that idea of contextualizing the particular check is part of what the process service would allow us to do. So you can define 10 processes. They can all pull from a pool of 50 checks that I might want to do. And how that plays out within the execution of the checks within that process may be different based on which process I'm in and what population I'm attached to. So for one population, it might be game over. You cannot do anything. For another population, it might be here's the warning. For another population, it might be um, oh, well, right now I guess those are the only two we've defined. It's a warning. Oh, maybe it can actually route you to the place where you can request an exemption. So this is all still sandboxy stuff, but we, we, we are now, we've been working on this for about two months as a service design team, starting to expose it both to the analysis and development group. And we're feeling like we've got something really good here that's going to give us the right amount of visibility um, from a UI perspective, but also the, the differencing and the, the, the hooks, if you will, to the complexity that we know we have to support since we're not building a point application for one institution. We're building a, a system that can solve not only all of our problems, but we're hoping this continues to take off and we get more partners, um, um, other, well, a lot of other institutions in the pile. So. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty excited about this. <laughs> so it's one of our big next steps, exciting. and we're starting with a discussion actually variety of this week, is what are really the boundaries as we start pushing into rules and KRMS, and how do we, how do we sort that out? So thank you for letting me talk about services. Oh, very, very exciting. Very innovative design going on in that group. So, are there any questions around the, the process service? I, I see some questions are, are getting dumped in the Google Doc, and I'm, I'm trying to respond um, as best I can. Some I'll have to circle back on. But are there any general questions before we move on to our last two items? Nope.